Welcome to the online ministry of Pidcoke United Methodist Church. Pidcoke UMC is located on FM 116, about halfway between Gatesville and Copper's Cove. We have a 10 o'clock service on Sunday mornings in our sanctuary, an in-person service for the small congregation. So if you're looking for an intimate place to worship among people who simply want to sing God's praises and hear God's word proclaimed, please come and be with us. 10 o'clock on Sunday mornings, Pidcoke United Methodist Church on FM 116, about halfway between Gatesville and Copper's Cove. As most of you know, this will be my last Sunday uh, doing uh, a video for you like this. It will also be my last Sunday in the pulpit at Pitco UMC as I'm going to be retiring. Uh, this My appointment ends at the, at the end of this month, at, at July 1st actually, and uh, this will be my last Sunday. So uh, it's been my distinct privilege for the last 15 months to be able to provide these short messages for you, to provide opportunities for worship when we were still doing a, an online worship service. Uh, but I, I've, I've enjoyed doing this, and it's been a blessing to me, and I hope it's been a blessing to you. If you'd like to continue to uh, see my, my daily devotionals that I send out each day, uh, those will be also ending at the end of this week. Um, but I plan to, to restart that on a different platform uh, using a slightly different venue uh, sometime in the near future, hopefully in the next couple of months. Uh, so if you'd like to be part of that, if you'd like to receive those, or hear, get information about that, you'll see my email address and my phone number uh, at the end of this video. So hang on for just a moment at the end of this video and you'll, you can see my contact information uh, and where you can send me an email or send me a text uh, or call if you'd prefer uh, to let me know that you'd like to be on, uh, on the information list uh, for, that, for that ministry when that begins to, to be available again. But this morning we want to spend just a few moments looking at a passage of scripture from uh, Paul's letter to Second Corinth to the second letter rather to the Corinthians. So, in just a moment, you will we'll begin that message. If you ever have your Bible available, I'd like for you to turn to the book of Second Corinthians, Second Corinthians chapter eight. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Keep your, hold your place there for a few moments as I give you a few introductory comments to kind of set the background for this passage of Scripture that we're going to be looking at this morning. When Paul was in the, in the mid-50s, sometime about 20 years after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, as Paul was evangelizing in Macedonia and Athens and Corinth, the region of Palestine, Israel, if you will, uh, was convulsed by rebellions against Roman authority, against the Roman government that had colonized that area. As a result, Rome had come down hard, or was in the process of coming down hard. In fact, they were only a few years away from uh, Jerusalem being completely destroyed and all the Jews in that region being sent out and sent away into exile. But because of the Roman, because of the Roman opposition to these rebellions, their, their attempt to put down those rebellions, the church in, in Jerusalem and all of that, that region, along with the general populace, was suffering extreme privation. There was a lot of hunger, a lot of premature death, uh, just a tremendous amount of suffering. When the church in Corinth, this newly planted church, heard about this, they wanted to provide relief uh, to their brothers and sisters, uh, their spiritual ancestors in a way, living there in, uh, living there in Palestine. So they wanted, to, they wanted to, to do something for them. And they'd enthusiastically pledged themselves to take up a collection and send that money to Jerusalem in order to bring relief, to at least provide some relief for the, uh, for the folks there. Now, Corinth was a prosperous city. It was a port city. It was a, uh, it was a colony of Rome. So it was a, a very prosperous city, and they would have been able to take a good, a good collection and send it uh, to those who were less fortunate than them, those who were suffering back in, in Jerusalem. But so far, they hadn't done that. It's been about a year, and they haven't done that. Now, so Paul, Paul's going to address that. Now, as we read here in, in this passage of Scripture, which we'll read in just a moment, we see here the message of a loving pastor to a church that he's labored over that he's still concerned about and still trying to guide and direct. 
Now, Paul had seen their divisions over certain leaderships. As they, as they said, well, I belong to Paul, and I belong to Peter, and I belong to Apollos, uh, following those leaders as opposed to being united around the idea of who Jesus is. He'd seen their spiritual immaturity that had led to uh, all sorts of conflict within the church. He'd seen their tolerance and immorality. And as a pastor, he'd not, not shied away from addressing those things in his communications to them. But here we want to take up Paul's message to the Corinthian church regarding their intent to provide aid to the believers in Jerusalem. Read with me, if you will, please, from Roman, excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And I'm going to begin reading in verse 1 and read down through verse 15. Brothers and sisters, we want to let you know about the grace of God that was given to the churches of Macedonia. While they were being tested by many problems, their extra amount of happiness and their extreme poverty resulted in a surplus of rich generosity. I assure you that they gave what they could afford and even more than they could afford, and they did it voluntarily. They urgently begged us for the privilege of sharing in this service for the saints. They even exceeded our expectations because they gave themselves to the Lord first and to us, consistent with God's will. As a result, we challenged Titus to finish the work of grace with you in the way he had started it. Be the best at this work of grace. Be the best in this work of grace in the same way that you're the best in everything, such as faith, speech, knowledge, total commitment, and the love we inspired in you. I'm not giving you an order, but by mentioning the commitment of others, I'm trying to prove the authenticity of your love also. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Although he was rich, he became poor for your sakes, so that, we, so that you could become rich through his poverty. I'm giving you my opinion about this. It's to your advantage to do this, since you not only started to do it last year, but you wanted to do it too. Now finish the job as well so that you may finish so that you finish it with as much enthusiasm as you started, given what you can afford. A gift is appreciated because of what a person can afford, not because of what that person can't afford, if it's apparent that it's done willingly. <clears throat> it isn't that we want others to have financial ease and you financial difficulties, but it's a matter of equality. At the present moment, your surplus can fill their deficit so that in the future their surplus can fill your deficit. In this way, there is equality. As it is written, the one who gathered more didn't have too much, and the one who gathered less didn't have too little. This reading coming from the Common English Bible. Now, Paul is urging them, he's urging the church to, to fulfill the faith, to, to fulfill the, the promise that they made, this pledge that they had made to provide an offering for the church in Jerusalem. The problem that we had is they had overpromised and underdelivered. So how does Paul propose to motivate them to fulfill their pledge? Well, first, he wants to, he shows them the example of others. He talks, he begins here by talking about the Macedonian churches, the churches in Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea. And there may have been others, but we know about those because we read about them in Scripture. But as we look at their, their performance against their pledge, we, we see that they were, they were giving, and not just giving, but giving generously. Now, there had been recently been a civil war in this region, and it had been suppressed by Rome with a, lot of, with a great deal of violence and destruction. So these people were suffering. They were impoverished. There was a great deal of suffering in their, in their, their midst. Nevertheless, in a severe test of affliction, Paul tells us, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty had overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. In my times in the African nation of Zimbabwe, it's been my privilege to worship in a number of United Methodist churches and in, a few, in churches of a few other denominations as well. And one thing that's always impressed me uh, about, about the African Christians, those in Zimbabwe that I'm familiar with at any rate, is how they take a collection. A collection basket is placed in the front of the, the church, whatever that sanctuary happens to be. Sometimes it's a, a building with brick walls and sometimes it's just a, an arbor with brush or, or palm leaves stretched over the top of it. But when the offertory begins, whether it's sung or played or both, 
people literally dance down the aisles or across the dirt floor, sometimes sand, to get to that basket to bring their gifts. There's no long, sad faces like we see so many times when the collection is taken in our midst. The joy that they have at being able to give is obvious, no matter how small their gifts may be. I picture something like this, similar to this in the description that Paul gives of the churches in Macedonia and their giving. This is the example that Paul is giving to the church in Corinth. He said, look, they are poor. These people are suffering because of their want and their privation, and yet they're giving and giving generously. They were giving of themselves first, first to God, then to Paul as their leader, and then giving what they could to be part of this collection for the saints in Jerusalem. Others with far less to give, he's telling them, are gladly giving sacrificially, first giving themselves to God and then giving themselves to their leadership. Now, he said in New Corinthians, it's up to you to follow their example. Now, Secondly, the Apostle Paul is, is citing the example of Jesus Christ himself. He had set aside his deity, emptied himself is the terminology that Paul uses in Philippians, so that he could take the form of humanity, so that he could give all that he had. The one who possesses all laid aside it all in order to be like us, so that he could bring to us this gift of salvation. I read recently that Jeff Bezos, who's now the, considered to be the richest man in the world, is estimated to be worth something like $199 billion. That's billion with a B. Imagine if Jeff Bezos were to give away everything he has, all of it, take vows of poverty, and devote himself to serving the downtrodden for the rest of his life. That would be a huge gift, and yet it's not even a down payment of what Jesus has done. This one who possesses all the wealth and power in the universe became poor for our sakes, he's telling the, the Corinthians and us, so that we might be made rich through his unspeakable gift. He's telling the Corinthians with such an example of generosity with such an example set for you, how can you hold back? He's saying that same thing to us as well. And then thirdly, as he talks to the Corinthians, he's reminding them of their own past record. As you excel in everything, he says, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. He's saying to them, you've been the best in everything you've done. Now, be the best in showing God's grace to your brothers and sisters too. Fourthly, Paul admonishes them to translate their fine feelings into action. We preachers sometimes are, seem to be experts at being able to stir people's emotions. And certainly when we talk about faith, when we talk about uh, conviction for sin, when we talk about the Holy Spirit moving upon God's people in order to prompt action in us, certainly there's a lot of feeling and emotion involved in that. But feelings are only of value when they produce action. If they don't produce any action, then they're only feelings. And feelings left to themselves are worthless. The Corinthians had been among the first to rise in sympathetic solidarity with the Christians in Jerusalem and Palestine. Now they were being urged to take that sympathy and turn it into action. You've been excellent in all of these things, Paul says. Now, be excellent in this work of grace, too. Good intentions wouldn't provide food for the Christians in Jerusalem. Only coins in the collection plate could do that. And finally, the Corinthians are reminded that life has a strange way of evening things up, as William Barclay put it. Give, and it will be given to you, Jesus said. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Give a blessing, he's saying, and blessings will come back to you in abundance. It's a good way to paraphrase what Jesus is saying here. Interestingly enough, in the context, 
of Jesus' remarks, he's not talking about money. He's talking about tolerance and forgiveness, not material things at all. But I digress. Still, the principle holds true. Give, and it will be given to you. Paul's not urging the Corinthians to give <clears throat> to, in order to receive. That's a selfish motive that God won't honor. He's simply showing them or reminding them that when they give, the blessing they bestow will be a blessing to them in return. Elsewhere in his writings, Paul urges the elders of the church in Ephesus to help the weak, remembering, he says, the words of the Lord Jesus himself, who said it is more blessed to give than to receive. Notice that Paul isn't commanding the Corinthians to give. He's, he's not commanding them to, to drum up an offering. Oh, I've been in services where, uh, you know, the arm twisting was just unbelievable for people to give. The, the guilt that would be laid on people if, you, if they don't give. I've seen those kinds of services. But Paul's not doing that here. He's exhorting the Corinthians and us to give because it's the right thing to do. And the performance of this proper action will benefit them as well as those to whom they give. Now, that's all well and good. But let me get to the heart of the matter. The Corinthians knew full well what Paul was driving at. They'd made a commitment, but hadn't lived up to it fully. Sort of like what we United Methodists do when we repeat our vows of, our vows of membership uh, when at, at someone's baptism. We vow to be loyal to the United Methodist Church and to uphold it by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. We do that with the best of intentions. Sometimes we even do it with great feeling. Whenever I baptize someone, whether that's a, a, an, a, an infant or a grown person, I'm always moved by the solemnity of the vows that I make to support and encourage them to fulfill this same vow themselves. But somewhere along the way, our feelings diminish and our commitment begins to fade. We vow to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. That's our mission as United Methodists. But do we? How many have you led on the path of discipleship lately? How many have I led? So, as I prepare to retire from the pastorate, from pastoral ministry, here's the challenge that I want to give you. I want to leave this challenge with you. It's the same challenge Paul gave to the Corinthians, but it involves more than just being faithful to fulfill a monetary pledge. It goes to the core of what we say we are as followers of Jesus Christ. Hear the words of that challenge. Now finish the job so that you finish it with as much enthusiasm as you started. We're not chastised because we're deficient or because we're uncaring or unfeeling. No. We're encouraged, reinforced, goaded on because we have the best of intentions. As we read in, this, in the translation of this verse, verse 11 here from the message, your heart's been in the right place all along. You've got what it takes to finish it up, so go to it. Did you catch that? You've got what it takes to finish it up, so go to it. There are souls to be saved. There are disciples to be made lives to change, a world to transform. Now finish the job. Again, my contact information is at the end of this video. If you'd like to uh, continue to get information about uh, um, publishing or other things that I'll be taking, uh, taking uh, part in as, uh, as I go into retirement from pastoral ministry, please. Contact me through the email address that you'll see or through the phone number that's there, either by text or, or by voice, either way. Uh, but I want to thank you for many of you have been so faithful to, to listen and watch uh, these videos, to read the daily devotionals, and I appreciate again your, so much your encouragement and your help. I want to say God's richest blessings upon you. May you go in grace. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ fill you. May the love of God enfold you. And may the companionship and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you always.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.